Uh, hello, welcome everyone to the uh, first the talk of the Active Matter Harvest Team Assessment of the Year. We're delighted to have Professor Farrell and Professor Petros Matsopoulos starting this off, and today he's going to be telling us about learning to school and the presence of hydrodynamic interactions. And then uh, for the Zoom eyes, feel free if you have any questions, either to just interrupt and ask or just type the message in the chat and we'll get to as soon as. How many Zoom people do we have? Uh, third, uh, 16. 16, great. You're very welcome. Thank you yes, for coming in. Razan, if you have any, like, if you want to anything that you want to tell me, please just provide us and I'll never try to take care of any problems that they cause. So, cool. Uh, okay. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and thanks to David for thinking of uh, inviting me to this uh, active matter. I know nothing about active matter. I'll tell you what I know and then maybe we can try to find connections between what we do and active matter. So uh, starting before I start, I'd like to thank the people uh, that have done uh, all the work. Uh, these are some of the people that they were with us uh, before. And actually, I think Bim and Mattia were postdocs here at, uh, at Applied Math with uh, Maha. Uh, and uh, and Mihalis is now in Switzerland, but Pascal and Lucas are right there. And I will be talking about some of their work as well. And and a lot of the things that you will see there, uh, they are very computation intensive. So there are special thanks to the Swiss National Supercomputing Center for giving us a lot of uh, a lot of time. So what is active matter? I do that for myself to understand um, what we are talking about. So I, I did some brief research of so what I did, I went and I found an, a, a collection of, of articles by Na in Nature that appeared about three years ago. And I guess the key thing is that you have this um, uh, set of objects of animals or things that they actually can propel themselves. And what is interesting for me uh, and where I try to make connection is that they all extract energy from their surroundings at the single particle level. So the question is, what is their surroundings? And for me, as I understand surroundings, is also the medium that connects um, the, uh, these individual particles. And the disturbances that one particle does to the medium, I take it that affects what happens um, to uh, the other uh, particles. So I see it as a coupled system of particles, and then there is an effort to extract energy from, from uh, from the environment uh, that they have at the individual level. Uh, <clears throat> moving on, uh, I wanted to see if I ever did anything related to, to this kind of stuff. So I found out actually I had an idea about 17 years ago that actually now I think it has become robots here at Harvard, but probably not so much connected. The idea is very simple. If you have a single vortex, um, the vortex can spin. Uh, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't go anywhere, but if you add another vortex, then you can start to get uh, emotion and, and uh, also you can get different patterns. So we had this idea with Flavio Noca at that time I was at NASA and, and it was Flavio Noca and uh, 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 Park and, and myself. And uh, we uh, wrote this technical memorandum, we have some kind of a pattern, the idea is that we should have robots like this and then they will be rotating paddle under. And, that would be the, the swarms. Now, um, <clears throat> another place where I have some work that is related, uh, there is this European Research, um, ERC, European Research Council Advanced Grants. And this was my grant in 2013, where the idea was to look at uh, collective phenomena, the fluid mechanics of collective behavior. So we were very much interested to see, for example, how fish schools are behaving, and we were interested to go and see how the fish change their environment by the lateral line, to look into what is the molecular behavior or, or micro scale behavior of the lateral line, and then to try to go and create tools for going through all these different scales. And at the same time, we were interested in cancer, we were interested in blood flows, and we were interested in uh, therapy uh, that involves nanoparticles that are traveling in the bloodstream. And then we were trying to make a lot of connections uh, between these two topics and try to create uh, tools. So, so Pekos, the lateral line of the fish, that's a pressure sensor? That's a pressure sensor, and, and they have also shear sensors in other parts of their body, like their, their tails, and their, there's also pressure sensors in other parts of the body, but their main thing is in their uh, lateral 
Thanks. So along the lateral line, they pick up pressure gradients in particular? Uh, it's not exactly clear to me, but I think they can print or they can uh, pick up pressure gradients also. And then distinguish from left and right pressures? There's one on the other side. There is. There, they, actually, we have done work where we have been looking at optimal sensing in fish, and we actually find out that having a, a lateral line at the place where fish usually have the lateral line is a possible place for optimally sensing the environment, and then you can have different signals left and right. Also. You can get a transverse pressure gradient very easily. Uh, you can probably get forces of some kind yeah. by, yep. by, by doing that. Pressure gradient would be complicated because you have the whole body there coming yeah. in between, but forces probably, I can imagine, you can get some sensing of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, feel free to, to interrupt. As I, as I told earlier, I sincerely believe I'm, I stand here to learn more from you than you can learn from me about active matter. So uh, here are some of the things where um, collective uh, swimming is, is interesting. Uh, of course, we can look at uh, these bait balls and try to understand why they do what they do. A little bit easy for fish to, to catch them. Um, there is, of course, uh, great work that has been happening. I think this was Radhika's uh, uh, robots, right? The, that they could swim together. And then there is other ideas uh, that it's actually not really active matter, but it's some kind of uh, there is energy extraction from the environment, and there are certainly interactions. So when you see all these wind farms, uh, wind turbine farms, uh, one wonders what can we learn from fish and perhaps apply them to these uh, applications. So on the wind farms, have they optimized uh, the location? So no. They, no, they should. No, they should. I think they should, and they should. Uh, so so the, the original person who had this idea, actually, of these similarities, a, a colleague from Caltech, John Dadiv, uh, he deserves the credit for thinking about these things. But we have been thinking about that. I'll show you some simulations later that one of my former postdocs has been doing on things like that. But there's many things you can do here. You can think especially of moving them in different <laughs> locations and also changing their pitch. So they can become some kind of like huge scale active matter. If you like. Yeah, I mean, I could imagine that especially the directions could be talking to each other and maybe you know, get instability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's actually, if I don't know how the wind is coming, I expect that they're going like that and being at the wake of one another is the most inefficient thing I can imagine. And I will actually show you that this uh -huh. is inefficient for some. Some analog, of, some analog of drafting. <clears throat> well, the, the thing is that there is a lot of dead air somehow here. Yeah. It depends on how the, because the front is taking all the energy and it's, it's sending it back in different ways and it's not necessarily this is the, the, the best pattern. Now, people have been thinking about patterns, and uh, there's Daniel Weiss from Israel who has been uh, doing a lot of work, and he has come up with this idea of the uh, diamond pattern, uh, which actually has a problem. And the problem is, according to this picture of, of, uh, of uh, Daniel, I think the animals here are not really self propelled, but you have to imagine them that they're nailed in these locations and they are moving. And this is very different than if you propel yourself and you're moving and you're interacting to the vortices. Uh, this is a legendary paper that a lot of people have tried to, to learn and discuss about it, but I think there is a fundamental issue here that we need to be aware of, that um, there's difference between self-propelled versus fixed uh, animals that are, that are moving their fates. Um, question is, again, uh, this is all fine. What can we learn? Uh, so there is the this is the Egyptian synchronized swimming uh, team that's doing a <laughs> diamond formation. I thought it was uh, relevant. Uh, and then, uh, and, and then um, the question is, what can we replicate it? Do we like patterns? And then we are fascinated by that. And there is no hydrodynamics. There's tons of interesting uh, theories behind all that. Uh, now, uh, the way we uh, go about that, uh, uh, we are trying, and I'll show you basically the end of my talk at the beginning. So we actually tried to go in a brutal way of simulating the biggest fish pool ever simulated on Earth. And in fact, this is the biggest fish pool ever simulated with full Navier scopes. Uh, this is about 350 fish. It implies huge computational times, state-of-the-art numerical methods. There is no control. Uh, this uh, fish here, they have a prearranged uh, motion and as they move because of their interaction with the flow field, they're starting to take uh, different arrangements. Um, so this is one of these brutal uh, things that we are uh, 
going for, and I would like to argue why we go for this brutal thing versus doing simplified, more simplified uh, models. Now, another place where all these uh, active matters may be of interest is in uh, artificial micro streamers. Um, there's all sorts of different ideas of how you can get uh, micro streamers to work collectively. Um, and then, um, is there is there anything that, that we can do or we can learn from uh, what happens, for example, in sperms? There's all this collective motion, and, and, and then there's these ideas now of people doing assisted uh, fertilization that is very precise. Uh, there are people that, that are thinking of putting drugs on top of these microbots and then sending them in different parts of the uh, bloodstream, uh, thinking about uh, and, and through the bloodstream, thinking about target direct delivery. So here's work by Lucas Amundus, who's sitting here. Uh, Lucas has been doing simulations of these uh, devices, um, and then he's putting it in um, in uh, to, to swim in different hematocrits. And, and here is a, a question for the audience: uh, In which of one of these two hematocrits there is more less blood here, blood cells, and there is more blood cells? There's fluid also here that you don't see for visualization purposes. Where do you think the, the, the this guy is going to go faster? And there's more blood or when there is less blood cells? Well, the naive answer presumably is when there's fewer blood cells, but I guess it's just the end. <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly that's why I'm posing it as a question. <laughs> because that's what I would have thought. And, and, and it's actually the opposite way. And, and what happens is that uh, these guys that seem to uh, be using the elastic energy of the red blood cells, and then they're able to, um, to propel themselves a little bit faster um, than the other ones. But presumably there's a time scale for the uh, diffusion of the red blood cells and their like, motion. They're, they're, they're rearranging and this thing, they're, they're relatively static. So yeah, there is that, we have done, the, you have done this also with flow, right? Or, so then, yeah, I mean, I would think the, quite, the issue is whether if you're one of these, that, that's a, a model of a, of a hematocritical critter. Uh, like, this, these are we model the red blood cells. Every red blood cell. But is, the white thing is supposed to be a sperm. In, in the red, in, in it's the an ABM. System. It's an adapt. It's an artificial bacteria flagellum moved with a magnet. Okay, good. You apply good. the magnetic field, and it's comparable in size to the red blood cells. Ten to eight microns. Okay, it's roughly comparable in size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, as it the, there's this time scale, which is the traversal time of this little. Critter, yeah. How, how long does it take to go past the red blood cell? Do the red blood cells rearrange in that time? Evidently not. So, so I guess th th there's a, there's two regimes presumably depending on whether. I mean, these are uh, actually these are questions we should be writing down and and and, and look at them. Uh, but yes, there's a it's a it's a very it's a very rich system that one can. Yeah, I mean, here they rearrange as you see slightly. Yeah. Right. Right, but I, I guess I would have, I mean, I don't know, it, it probably both regimes are, can be relevant depending on what you put in there. Yeah, but no, it's a, there's, it's, it's a simplified thing that we say that it always works better in this higher hematocrit, but I don't know how many parametric studies you've so, done. So here there is a, uh -huh. the frequency of rotation is, yes. is set to uh, 100 hertz, but it's very arbitrary, we could also change it to you have a different ratio between the elastic time scale of the red blood cells. Yeah. I presume there's an exchange time for the red blood cells to, as, as they're jostling around in a real uh, mm -hmm. circulatory system. Uh, how long does it take for them to significantly rearrange? And then there's a traversal time for this lovely white critter mm -hmm. to go past a, a single red blood cell. And I would think the ratio of those times would, would be an important dimensional mm -hmm. number. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what it was here. In simulations, there is a uh, thermal fluctuations. Yes. In this simulation, the metal can heatly have thermal fluctuation. Right. So there's thermal fluctuations here. Yeah. So but also, as you say, when there's flow, there'll be other rearrangements, flow induced. And uh, I, 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 it's fascinating, and I'm just wondering. Another thing which we have that, that Lucas has done since we yeah. are on this uh, level okay. is to also uh, usually these things, if you let them um, uh, free, usually they marginate. Uh, they don't usually they, go. They, they to, go to the margin. They, they go to the, They get marginated by the. Okay. Uh, they get a pushed away from the red blood cells. And, okay. And here we have been. You have been applying some control to keep them in the center, right? 
I will come back to that because we are using also reinforcement learning and control to make all these guys do what we want. So in principle, there is one more thing about whether the red blood cells like them at all and, and, and uh, how much they push them on the sides. I guess in that case, probably this guy will go faster because there is more. When you let them free, probably the top one goes faster than the bottom because there is no red blood cell. I don't know. It's just uh, tons of things to, uh, okay. to explore. <laughs> but but we, we basically, what we try to do is to make a little water tank where we can examine all these things at the highest fidelity of physics possible that we can have. The word fidelity is a key issue in this talk, so I'll come back to that. Okay, and this, and this unit of hematocrit, that's the, some density, some packing fraction of the red blood cells? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So another, so these are some, just to show you that, uh, again, this uh, brutality that I mentioned earlier, these are a thousand of them. Uh, and then there is a single uh, magnetic field that is driving that and through the key thing to observe here is there is a whole bunch of hydrodynamic interactions that you are having, but you basically have one magnetic field, and then you hope that through all the interactions that they have, they will actually propel themselves in the same uh, direction. So you try to control a thousand of those with one uh, magnetic field, which is quite interesting. So optimizing all these containers, I think, would be a very exciting and interesting project. And, and the direction of, of propulsion of, of along the tube or uh, opposite is that that's uh, sort of they're 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 much, in the magnetic field protocol. They're moving, they fall in the magnetic field, yeah. yeah. So I, I just present you these are things we are, this is not published, nothing of this, none of this stuff is published. It's just to show you some things in the micro scale and we're welcoming. And when it goes through the tube, is there is the density staying homogeneous in the cross section, or does it also uh, tend to fractionate or gaps at the edges? We can ask uh, Lucas there. Sorry, I was but the, the, the question is: Does the density of these swimmers uh, uniform in a circular cross section, or do they tend to congregate near the edges or avoid the walls or what? So uh, I. Mostly looked at the velocity profiles that they create because okay. they, they have a collective motion. Um, regarding the density, I didn't see, I mean, it's not obvious to me. I, but it, I don't know. Yeah, there is a bit of populations. Some of these highly simplified models of active matter, I'm not an expert on active matter myself, but, uh, they, they, I, and, but, but Farzan maybe remembers. Uh, they produce a density in homogeneities. Uh, is that right, Farzan? Yeah. When you have flow. So, so I would monitor not only the velocity, but the density. And there, there are regimes where you know, counterintuitive things happen when you have these active self swimming things. Uh, I have some simulations. Maybe we can talk about sure. the simplified models because we played with that at some okay. point also. Uh, so, very quick thing about models. Okay. So, a lot of people talk about models, and I want to. Uh, raise awareness on, on, on modeling. Okay, so, so for example, uh, when we do these red blood cell models, you don't see all this. This is the fluid. This is a method called dissipative particle dynamics. Uh, there is a movement uh, that is, uh, there are some central forces, and then there is some dissipation, and then there is some fluctuation. And then this is a, a, a homage to the Empire Strikes Back or Star Wars, right? <laughs> so it doesn't supposed to be like water molecules. These are this this is the representation of the water. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. They're not molecules, but there is it's a mesoscale description of, of a fluid. I see. So there, there, there's there's a viscosity, the Stokes drive in each of these no, things. No, these are um, these are fluid elements, the method of dissipative particle dynamics. You have particles that they are interacting. They have a linear uh, conservative uh, field by which they're interacting. Okay. Uh, and then they have a dissipative term, which depends on the velocity differences between these two uh, particles. And then there is a fluctuation term that we are adding, thermal noise that we're adding to satisfy some kind of fluctuation dissipation theory. This thing is actually, in principle, a compressible fluid. Uh, okay. So it's not an incompressible fluid, but people use it because of all these things that you can take into account at this scale. I mean, you have to uh -huh. think again that this is eight micrometers, and then the fluid around. We, these are computational elements. Put it differently. These are computational elements that represent the fluid. And the red blood cell is biconcave in this particular. The red blood cell is a big story. So the red blood cell okay. is 
it's some of your stuff probably here. Uh, it's a it's a it's this um, membrane. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah. And, and then there is all sorts of terms that are entering in uh, in this uh, yeah. uh, calculations. And uh, before you shoot, let me finish. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Should I just no, no, I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Uh, my phone, no, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure we are not <laughs> butchering things here left and right. But this is so. There is all different motions that we try to take. So basically, when I started doing these kind of things, I looked at what people have been using for red blood cells in, in the community, and this is the model that we found. And then, actually, I started. Uh, a, an interaction uh, collaboration with a colleague, George Penelakis from Brown. Uh, and then I basically got the models that George had. And then my first question to George is, are the models validated? We actually applied for a big computer com com competition, the Gordon Bell Prize, that we could do up to a, a trillion computational elements and billion red blood cells. And asked George, are the, are the, the, the red blood cell model validated? And he says, let me send you a slide. So that's the slide that George sent me. Uh, and uh, these are all different simulations and experiments. And then you compare uh, different uh, things. For example, uh, up here, you have a red blood cell and you have beads and then you stretch the red blood cell. And then you're looking at the, at the aspect ratio uh, on, the, on the two axes. Then you put through a red blood cell through a constriction. And then you look at the, uh, the velocity, the transit velocity, versus the pressure difference that you have here. So you get that. And then there were a whole bunch of other things he, that, that he gave me. Actually, you could have some red blood cells that they could be um, uh, from, from sick. Uh, I think this is a paper about some the, the blue ones. They have something, some problem with their stiffness. Uh, this is like sickle cell anemia? This, exactly. This is yeah. simulations of sickle cell. Anemia, and, and also you put the red blood cells to go through different constrictions, and then you measure the velocity through that. So, question to you Do you accept this method of being validated? Just to give you my answer, I did. <laughs> I said this is great validation studies. But you found something where it didn't work. And that's right. So, I will tell you in a second what I think worked. So, but when someone shows you like something like that, right? You're done. You're, you're, you say, here's one, two, three, four geometries, constrictions, deformations. I catch all the experimental results, correct? Well, so the, the question though, the, the, blue, the blue are the sickle cells. Yeah, yeah. But, but those don't look like sickles. They're, they're, I, they're, I don't remember actually what the blue are. So I should be more careful. Uh, but I think uh, George has done some studies with sickle cell anemia. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I don't remember exactly. What is, what is the blue represent in the, in the middle picture then? I don't remember. Okay. I should put it like this. I should put it like this. But the story of validation is a story I care. I tell you. So we took all this and we collaborated with actually with a colleague from uh, the medical school, Mehmet from Air. Um, and Mehmet has some devices that they are depending on the geometry. Um, uh, you can, there is, you're using a fluid mechanics phenomena that are called lateral displacement. The idea is that this is very low Reynolds number flow. And if you have a small uh, uh, particle, then the small particle will keep going according to the Stokes line around this, um, this, uh, this post. And if you have a bigger particle, it will start bumping, 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 and then get separated. So again, this is one of the biggest simulations ever made on Earth. But the idea is that your colleague one likes these posts because it helps uh, do screen for disease cells. That's right, circulating tumor cells. And circulating okay. tumor cells, their clusters are bigger than about 30 to 40 micrometers. Okay. So the, the, these guys are, I mean, the red blood cells, you know what they are. Uh, we, can, we can play here like this uh, virtual CTCs and follow them and see if they go close to the post. Maybe you can do something to them at the post. In any case, we spent a lot of time and, and it was a, 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 a tremendous work by people, even to make this movie. Uh, Christian Conti still hates me for asking him to make this movie because they have to go in a simulation with a camera and follow the red blood cell and not be occluded by, to follow this green cell and not to be occluded by all the red blood cells. So how, how thick, how, how many red blood cell diameters in the out of uh, 
explain direction here? Uh, I think the whole thing was uh, about a millimeter, oh, 10 millimeters. I don't remember how big it was, this whole thing. Uh, I don't have the dimensions. I, I, I was just thinking, though, roughly the dimension perpendicular to the plane. So is it one blood cell? And oh, this be, between. Uh, no, no, other direction, out of the plane. So, so I, oh, no, these are big posts. Very long posts. They're long see. posts, yeah. yeah but yeah. in the simulations, did you have? Oh, it's all 3D. Okay. So we have done one to one. That was oh, the okay. argument for this award. To give us a millimeter size uh, micro device. I can find all the details. Okay. And then, then, then just another naive question. Why are the posts egg shaped rather than? Because circular? they. That's what they found out. It well, allows well, them. That helps them sort. Yeah. Right? And the idea was, Whoa. can we help them? Design uh, like designing kind of these kind of things. Yeah, we actually did uh, help them. And are the posts tapered, like like golf teams, or they are they are attached? To them. I understand, but they're, but they're independent of the z direction. They're cross sectionally independent. Yeah, of the z cross, it's independent. It's not. It's a little it's bit. Not? It's even in this z direction. It's a little bit narrow. It's tapered. It's yeah. tapered. Okay, and is that important? I don't know. This is way. According to McMahon, they experience. have they have spent okay. experimental with. Tens and hundreds of devices, as I remember. And this one works. They, they, they found, found something that in, works, and he actually says, okay. "Can you help us do better?" Us? And I said, "Here I am. Forget experiments anymore. You don't do. Uh, we will do everything in silico." Okay. So, okay, Mehmet said, "Okay, you get the separation there, similarly to what we get." And then he says, "How about if you try now another another device?" And I don't tell you. And I don't tell you what happens. Uh, so we take uh, my yes. geometry. Was it you doing that, Sergey? I'm sorry if I forgot. You. Yes, yes. You did that. Yes. So okay, yes. I apologize, Sergey. Let me know. So we have been in there. Okay, okay, already okay. from the okay. old okay. Uh, things. And I think also was doing this. I'm totally terrible. Uh, so simulation on the left, experiment on the right, or something. Yes, and then uh, there's tons of it, uh, discrepancies. The main, the main discrepancy. Well, there's a density difference, right? The, the red blood cells on the left are much denser. Than yes, but the basically difference. the key thing, the key okay. thing where we consistently sure. disagree. All right, thank you. Is this gap here that whenever the red blood cells here will come over, uh -huh. they will be, uh, uh, they will fly. And in the case of Mehmet, they will hug the, the surfaces. Ah. So that was a key thing that started. So we tried all sorts of things. So now here comes the dirty and dirty laundry. Uh, when you do, uh, so red blood cells, they have a, a plasma inside. Okay. So when we simulate this, this um, when we simulate these things, we also there is blue particles inside uh, the red blood cell. Okay. Now the viscosity inside the red blood cell is five times bigger than the viscosity outside the red blood cell. But when, if you want to do a simulation using a trillion particles, you cannot go and have for every single one of these red blood cells um, a, 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 some indices that they tell you, oh, this particle is inside, this particle is outside. You just run. You want to have the less, the less questions you ask, the faster your code is going to be. So there is a best. This is a, a first problem that a lot of the models that we saw previously being validated, uh, they have been validated with the same discussion. Same discussion inside. inside and outside. Yeah, right. Manifested. Right. All these things are uh, same discussed inside and outside, and probably, for obviously, what you see is the parameters. This was not a sensitive parameter for to cast the experimental results. But the other thing that absolutely disturbed me is that you have other things, you have springs and all that stuff that they change by an order of magnitude, uh, two orders of magnitude, and and then you never know what you have. So they just they just have lots of fitting parameters. Exactly. And so that so, exactly. can be a real problem. But, so. the, the, but the overall uh, picture, I guess, is because you have these asymmetric uh, ovals or these asymmetric pillars, that when you have a fluid velocity, then there'll be a, a, a particle or blood, blood cell flux at an angle. Is this, is that, that was, now I remember your, I, you know, your pictures, the, 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 there was a red blood cell flux that was going downward a little bit. Right. Uh, and and that, that was sort of the idea of your collaborators, that you could somehow sort them by having these asymmetric pillars. Is that yeah, because it's like, it's tilted a little yeah. bit. Yep. So basically red blood cells, they just should stay on the same level. 
despite the steel. I see. So, so it's, it's still you, you want them. Well. You want them to hug the thing and okay. stay there. Okay. And the other things in, in the physics is that you bump, 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 and you get expelled out. But this is a cancer, cancer cell. The big ones. The big one is yes, keep bumping. So it's never, it cannot, it cannot okay. fall between posts. So, so, so you can separate cancer cells from red blood yes. cells by this ingenious asymmetric post. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That was the basic idea. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's, okay. that's, that's, that's not even Matt's idea, right? It's, 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 it's not, yeah, it's not his. It's, it's called DLD, deterministic lateral displacement. So, I, so but it's 2005, I think. Because science it was invented in 2005. Okay. But then Matt, I think, was the first to, to, uh, to apply it in something big. No, no, actually, yes. Another thing which is uh, important is because you want to screen a lot of blood, the Reynolds number here, uh, according to the flow velocity, yeah. it's about 100. So these things are flowing through fast. Huh? There is, uh, it's not uh, Stokes so, flow. So, so, so before this 2005 paper, though, presumably people had tried to filter out cancer cells just by using filters. Right. And, 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 and this is better? In, in, because, principle, in principle, could be better. It doesn't clog, for example. It doesn't clog. Okay, and you could also maybe if even had the same, if it had the roughly the same size, filters wouldn't work, but maybe it has different elastic properties. So you filter by the elastic properties, and you just pointed out that the red blood cells have yeah. this important feature. Now, is, what is is it known for these tumor cells whether they have an, a, also a, a large anisotropy in the viscosity inside versus outside? I, I don't know, but I think there's probably like okay. clusters of cells. That's the way I would I would think of it. It's not just a not just one. It's not just one. It's a red, red blood cell which is unique because it's empty inside. Yes, no, 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 no typical yes. cell. Yeah, yeah right. Right. They have some no, no genome and etc. Yeah, okay. Because it's like container basically for hemoglobin. Okay, and then the cancer cells have are coming clusters. So that's, thanks for being so patient with all my questions. That's fine. The, 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 these cancer cells presumably are clumped because they're dividing and 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 producing offspring. This is why they're cancer, and so that's that's why they're big and clumped. And but they never get so big that they that they can't get through these rows of pillars. Um, that, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, you try to you try to look at markers, and then the the things okay. that they try to look they're okay. about. 30 to 40 micrometer long. I'm sure there are probably other clusters, but there are okay. there. Uh, so there's tons of interesting uh, questions and, and there's a lot of empiricism in building these devices. Um, and the idea was, can we have an in silico lab on a oh, chip? Oh, no, that's fantastic. I, to, I, I, to, I, to help the people by, by testing out some designs. So if you want, a, is there a commercial product now? I think McMahon has separation idea. He did it, right? He has. I don't know if he sells it. Start up with I don't know. We have to check yeah, about McMahon. Yeah. Incidentally, if you want some food for thought, the more yes. difficult problem is to separate things that are smaller than the red blood cells, because the deterministic lateral displacement does not work anymore. But so, uh, so yeah, that's actually very interesting for bacteria to try to uh -huh. catch so, bacteria in red blood in, in, in blood in the bloodstream and get yes. them separated. I see. Wow. So so we have all sorts of aspirations, but I told you the, the, the thing is that to me it's like I tried to make a, a, a facility that checks for things like that, but first I have to be sure for all that. So the last I think five or ten years, five years, seven years. Five, we have been doing, a lot of people have been doing uncertainty quantification, data-driven uncertainty quantification for all these parameters. Okay. So now I think we have uh, error bounds and we have improved blood cell uh, models that where we can put uncertainties around our results in a, in, a, in a proper way and we can argue how we calibrate it and so on. So I, I believe a lot of these things that people have done in red blood cells, I think need to be revisited because <laughs> Just capturing something that is not like overfitting and fitting an elephant to overfit. Uh, so models too. Um, I'll show you some simulations on fish. Simulations how they work. They work with this um, penalization method. The idea is that we solve the Vorticity equation of the Navier Stokes, and then because we have a lot of complex geometries, we use this technique which is called penalization. Penalization is like a Lagrange multiplier where you take an indicator function and then you try to drive the velocity uh, that you have in the fluid to the velocity of, that you have on the surface. Yeah, what, why do you do this? You do this because you don't want to have 
a grid that is trying to adapt onto the shape of the body because the body is deforming very much. And I can tell you when we first started doing fish, we took uh, body conforming meshes and it was a nightmare and we could not actually do some very interesting movements. Here, what you do is you have a, 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 you have a, a, a grid and then uh, you consider, for example, this, this function x chi that I have here is zero outside the fish uh -huh. and it's one inside the fish, okay? So, so that, that's what you do. And, and then you have to consider the fluid that's going in and, and then because of the momentum of the fluid that's going in here, that's actually how you get the, the, the self-propulsion. So, so, so chi now chi is a is a scalar function. It's the, chi is a scalar. I'll, I'll show you in a second what chi. Is. Okay. This is the whole algorithm, and this is the this is the ah, come on. This is the the chi function in the end. It's a it's a chi. This is the so-called fish. This is the so-called tilt fish. It's actually the fish is a bag of fluid. It's a two-dimensional fish. We can have three D. Okay, and now did you think this is a trick for getting the grid, the mesh, to uh, follow smoothly? No, there's the, the mesh does not follow smoothly, but okay, the mesh, sorry. the mesh is like this. Uh, you want to solve things fast? Yeah. Uh, you will see the mesh in a second, and then the body just cuts is the mesh like that, except that this is a function of its one, uh, one in here, yeah. and zero up here. Okay, and then again, for those of us that are unfamiliar with the chi term, uh, can you go back to the slide that had that? Uh, there we go. It's a uh, scalar. Sorry? It's a scalar. It's a scalar, but then it looks like you have a curl, or is that the gradient of the chi term? Uh, because in, you, in that last yeah, no, this is the curl, but then you take the curl of this thing uh, here. Oh, I see. Chi is, chi is not a function of UI minus U, it's, it's chi time. Chi time, so that's right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit sometimes uh, not nice. Well, but, uh, I, I think I finally. We work in velocity vorticity. Okay. Yeah, so if you don't do velocity vorticity, this, this, this thing is away. Yeah. So imagine you're in velocity pressure and then you have chi i yeah. times this. And then you take the curl of the Navier stone. And then you get it down. And then you get it down there. That's all. Huh. So lambda is like a dissipative coefficient. It's kind of it's a Lagrange multiplier that we don't know what it is actually. We tweak uh -huh. it. I see. So, so it's a uh, parameter. Yeah. Is, when when was this Brinkman penalization invented? Uh, uh, it's uh, the original people are Ango, Renault, okay. and Fabry. Okay. Twenty something years ago. But it's some art. It's just not. It's not present in. The, I know you're taking the curl of the Navier-Stokes equation. It's not present in the real Navier-Stokes equations that. I grew up with. No, no, it, it is, is the Navier Stokes equation plus boundary conditions. Plus the boundary conditions. There's a way of implementing boundary That's right. Sense. So you do, let's say, let's say I write the uh, uh, Navier Stokes uh, as uh, yeah. this, yeah. right? And then yeah. I have u uh, is equal to ui on two omega. And then I take this guy here, right. and then I write it as lambda chi i, because that gives me that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, so uh, yeah, lambda, 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 I, we try. So when I started doing fish, I was doing body fitted grids, and I have another story I can tell you. So at some point, I was interested in something called the sea start, uh -huh. where a fish curls up onto itself, and there was no body fitted mess that could ever be able to capture that because the, the mess would get so distorted that right. everything would blow up. So that's why we moved to that. So this is yeah. Go ahead. Question. Oh, so can I understand this term as like the stirring work that the fish is doing to fall is embedded in this term? Yeah, sure. So so um so when the fish is uh, swimming, yeah. Deployed, yeah. like I, I I can imagine like the fish is doing some work to the fluid because it's stirring yeah. the fluid. Yeah. So uh can I understand that term as uh the stirring work? That the fish is doing to the fluid. way you understand why I would understand it is you make the fish to be part of the fluid. 
That's what I would do it, except that this fluid there has the velocity of the body of the fish. That's the way I would put it. Uh, I see. The, the fact that the, the fluid, the body is that the fish is still in the fluid right. is coming because of the vorticity that is coming uh, naturally because of the no steep boundary condition into the fluid. So the fluid is being steered by the vortices that we have. Okay, not by the the, the body produces the vortices and the vortices is still the fluid. And we are actually not considering the work or any like energy term or, or force. There's no energy but term. We are I do the boundary condition. Yeah, but it is uh, kind of the stirring is employed by the boundary condition. That's right. But this 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 uh, this thing here can do whatever this this boundary condition here yes. can be a time dependent boundary condition. I presume you'll get work heat will be done uh, generated by the viscosity of the current. So uh, yeah, you get uh, automatically, I think. So good, great question. Good. Thank you for your patience. I have a quick question. Is the lambda time dependent? No. It's a fixed. It's a it's an ad hoc parameter the lambda. And you have to sort of play with it until you get a good answer. That's right. You validate for different Reynolds numbers that you know. Uh, and uh, you try to catch the, to capture certain validations. Uh, let me show you quickly a validation. I don't know if you've ever seen the C start that I do. Uh, this is actually what the grid looks like, by the way. The grid is actually a, a work of art because I don't know if you can see, but the grid is adaptive. This is a wavelet adaptive grid um, that you're using wavelets to decide um, how. So there's two great things here. First of all, you're resolving only vorticity, which is at the wake. And you don't do velocity pressure where you have to have the whole thing. And on top of that, you do multi-resolution on the vorticity. So you have all these adaptive uh, fields. And I think if I go to much later, I don't know if I will make it much later, but just maybe I start to show you things left and right. Uh, this is the 3D. Uh, version of, of this. Uh, you cannot see it because the resolution is not so good. You can, can you see the grid changing? Ah. It has to do with the, with, with the resolution that with which you... Basically, you basically need to use fewer uh, grid points when uh -huh. you are you have smoother vortices and you're using more grid points where the vortices have smaller scales to capture. Do, the, do, the, do these uh, five fish have excluded bodies interaction in that previous movie? No, they interact hydrodynamically. Right, but but well, if they were to collide, they if they, they were to collide, they, they, you would have to make them uncollide. <laughs> so that doesn't you just we, they what are the situations where they don't collide. We don't know. We have actually now a, a, an ad hoc way that when they collide, when they collide, I mean. The, 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 you start losing the Navier Stokes between their the, the collision points. Yes. So you have to artificially add a repulsion term for them to go away. Okay, so you keep that. Okay. Yeah. So we can, there's 350 fish that you show. Mihaly gets a lot of credit for making it actually to allow collisions and the code doesn't go up. And this parameter lambda is a function of Reynolds number? Yes, it is also. Yeah, you can, you can put it as a function of Reynolds number. I mean, basically, going in the code, right? there is two ways to handle this penalization term, right? Yep. You can either go about integrating it explicitly or implicitly, right? and, and, and depending on that, you, you're bound to stability constraints. So if you're doing it explicitly, maybe you have to have it time dependent. So it has to be like the oh, of time number with the time step has to be in between one and, and two. Okay. But what we are handling it now implicitly, and then you can just send it to infinity, basically. So what we use is 10 to the power of 12, which is just uh, super large. Essentially. Because yeah, in the end, this should go to in the limit of, of lambda going to infinity, you basically you were able to prove that, that you're imposing the right boundary from you. So I will skip the C start. I can tell you with words that there is this C start of the fish. And then actually we figure out that the C start is optimal because we put down a fish and then we run an optimization. We say, what's the fastest speed you can get? And then what came out is actually the C start as an optimal solution in nature. So that's yeah, another thing. Yeah, I mean, there's no hard boundary, by the way, at two o'clock. Right? Uh -huh. so, so well, I can go back to the C start, but I want to. But it's up to you. 
I go, I can go back to sea start later because it's a very fascinating. Talk. And now I want to go to doing uh, many fish here and, and all sorts of uh, things and what people have done. Uh, so, I, um, uh, so there is a lot of people that there is this thing here. There is people who do experiments, which is very exciting. And then there is this uh, 3D simulations uh, that are the precursor of this 350 that I showed you. Important thing to see and to uh, that we all agree, or we try to agree, or we think that they can do that. But um, this fish here, they set vortices, and then, or maybe there is an obstacle that sets vortices, and then this guy can come back here and extract the energy from those vortices. And and actually, I can show you simulations of that thing also, where we indeed observe that. Okay. Uh, now, there's of course. Actually, I'll come back to this. It's, it's supposed to be the other way, the movie. Now, if I want to achieve, when I started doing all this, I want to achieve schooling. And, and I put down a whole bunch of fish. I will give them different motions. I will never get schooling. I would do, I would run my optimization studies. I would never get them to swim together. They would always influence each other and pull each other apart. And, and that's where comes this video. If anybody knows, I think it's Japanese. So uh, these are real people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, so, so can you guys uh, know how this uh, is happening? happening? I don't know what you do you uh, uh, can you guess what's the story here? <laughs> So now the mic is off. Oh, well, that's another thing. Yeah, yeah. That's nice. that's so that's basically, that's they feed them with magnets. Oh, and then there is someone under there with a magnet that's dragging the fish. <laughs> because if you look, if you pay attention, the, the motion that they do does not change at all. These poor fish, they do what they always do. But then sometimes they go fast, sometimes they go slow, sometimes they turn, and it's all because of the magnets. But if you pay attention to this, to me, it was fascinating because it tells you that people who do also simulations do a lot of things like that. And that's not. So, so the, the, there are four four magnets under the aquarium that, at, with this rhombic shape. That's right. And, they and there, there is someone under there that drives. And, 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 and these people with their hands, that was just a distraction. You remember the old story with the mechanical Turk? Uh, yes. It's the same story. Wow. <laughs> wow. Anyway, a uh, story is that there's other ways that people can try to do alignment. So a lot of people do swarms. They have these ideas that I will not. Uh, you just try to head with the local heading of your mates. Um, you avoid crowding. You go to the other's positions. And now we check all that. Uh, but apparently, uh, uh, it's kind of misleading when people say that you can get um, collective motion with that. You spend a lot of time running a lot of simulations with these three rules. And the thing that you see here, the red uh, things that you see, is uh, when you get collisions. So there is a lot of collisions that happen with these three rules. So these three rules does not prevent you from having um, uh, collisions. And, and, and not only that, after that, what we did is we added a, a dipole term to each one of these um, uh, particles, and then the Reynolds rule is gone. 
Is you never get this one. Never get this one. So all these things about swarming that has appeared, uh, I think, has an issue. Uh, very serious for me, and I think a lot of the results that are coming out are basically where the red blood cells have parameters. Uh, these are also parameters. So what you observe is the result of your parameters and your modeling choices. And I'm not sure uh, whether um, you learn about uh, nature. Uh, another thing to, to show you is that uh, what happens, uh, we did some simulations where we put an obstacle here and, and the obstacle is, is moving and you see the vorticity. And then the question was, does this thing here affect how uh, the other obstacle uh, is moving? So depending on the amplitude and the Reynolds numbers, we actually found sometimes that you can slave it and sometimes you don't slave it. And then there's the question is, if you wanna look at slave master, if you look at it in potential flow, so this is some work that was done in potential flow, that you have two cylinders and you have them to couple themselves through, um, uh, through different, through, through an oscillatory motion. And what they found is that if you move, I think with a, um, uh, are placed at, at 100. Um, so in one case, you have a minus sign of T. And then in this case, when you have minus sign of T, the, this guy drifts away. And when you have plus sign of T, this guy gets attracted. So that's a model that is potential flow. But now if you, uh, let me go to the result. If you go and, and you do the study, actually you find exactly the exactly opposite things. So first of all, you find out that if you include Reynolds number, uh, you, you never have, uh, a difference, the in-phase, out-of-phase does not depend on the, uh, the in-phase, out-of-phase is not important. What is important is the Reynolds number. And if you go, the other thing that is also important, you would think that potential flow is the limit of the high Reynolds number. Well, what you find that in high, uh, uh, high Reynolds number, you actually get the particles to be repelled, no matter if you are in phase or out of phase. So that's some warning about the different models. So the two things that are being are interacting here, one of them is perhaps uh, an obstacle, as you say, and the other is living, is some living creature. That's right, that was And they can be trained or not. That's right. Like a function of levels of levels. That's right. Not of the in-phase, out-of-phase uh, motion. Uh, we've done a lot of studies of that. I, I can get back to that. So, so, so a lot of these active matter people, have, uh, they, they, they often work in a regime where uh, they have, two flat plates that are very close to each other. Yeah. And so there's some screening just because geometrical screening and mm -hmm. conventional ideas about unbounded flow and metals numbers might have to be modified. They, they, they escape from having to deal with these very serious problems for real school of fish by working in a planar geometry. Could, could, that, could, they, could that save their conclusion perhaps? I don't know. You, you could easily simulate with the two flat plates and then I, uh, two flat plates and, and movement. There's all sorts of vorticity on the flat plates that's going to be happening. Sure, sure. But uh, I think that should be taken into account. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 I can do. I can do any. I mean, the thing is that we are okay. open to interactions and to ask right, uh, right, questions right. to people. I, I'm not in this community. I'm not trying to yeah. defend them. But I'm just saying that I, when I give them a hard time, they often escape by saying that. You're, you have a, uh, a situation which is very confined in the z direction. So it's quasi two dimensional. And then you have a sink uh, for momentum yeah. uh, that's bled out of the system. And so it's a it's not just Stokes equation with a large drag coordinate. Yeah. Anyway, anyway so, I, so just to move on, yes, uh, I want to I wanna do control now. I want to show you things with control. And there's all the stories about intelligence and what is intelligence and artificial intelligence. Yeah. And all this hoopla. I'm not going to go into details. I, I, I'm interested very much in all these things in reinforcement learning, which, as I understand, has a long history at Harvard uh, through this thing here, uh, which is Skinner. Right. Correct?
Who's to artificial vision? So there's a lot of deep reinforcement learning going on, state of the art, uh, and a lot of uh, famous people uh, working on this, including my former postdocs, actually, Tori Grapel is one of the people who did this go, one of the smartest people I know. Uh, and and uh, the story also of uh, AI and fish, there's a lot of uh, uh, artificial aquariums. Uh, this is <laughs> work by Dimitri Terzopoulos and others at UCLA since I think 30 years now. It's actually amazing. So, so actually, Dimitri uh, did things where these fish learn to swim. Uh, they learn to capture prey and, and all sorts of beautiful things. Uh, I had a long discussion with Dimitri and I was asking, what is the physics? And he says, there's no physics. Uh, we just do some kind of uh, of models that we care about uh, realism uh, and that's actually fair because it's graphics and, and that's that's what it is uh, now uh, if you take all these deep reinforcement learning codes and you apply them to a fluid mechanics problem they don't work uh, you can take everything from deep mind uh, etc and you try them at least to the best of our knowledge and i would welcome colleagues to, uh, to, to discuss this, uh, we didn't find it work. And then also we spent some time uh, thinking about our own reinforcement learning algorithm. We came up with something called remember and forget, experience we play. This is an idea of Guido Novati. The idea of reinforcement learning is that you are doing some kind of an online sampling of, uh, of, of information. And, and what is experience you play? If you have played the games many times, you have created a library where you have all your experiences. This was the state, that was my action, that was a reward. This was the state, this was the action, this was the reward. So basically when you do reinforcement learning, what you do is very often, instead of sampling from the current probability distribution of your data, you look back at previous probability distributions. This is kind of an important sampling that you're doing. And then uh, what we found is that if the probability distributions from the past have no relevance to the current probability distributions, this thing can go unstable or may not work. We found this to be very important uh, in, in fluids. And this is this uh, remember and forget. You look at cumulative reward. Uh, this is a, a comparison with some very famous uh, work, trust region policy optimization. Uh, this is the humanoid test. This is our result and this is their result. Interesting thing about this thing here, it, it kicks itself and then it flies. <laughs> but it's, it's better than, 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 than all the other things. But again, we are a group that's not known for reinforcement learning, but I'll be happy to compare in, in uh, the, the things. So, so, so what are you doing on the right that's different than on the left side? It's a completely different uh, policy of how you act. Okay. You have learned, we found that by maximizing the reward, we could get uh, a better solution than the other on the left. Better meaning more realistic, or the guy runs fast? No, it runs faster. Runs faster. That, that's yeah. the right thing. Realistic, I'm not so sure. I mean, look at that, and look at that. I mean, what's broken the, the symmetry between right and left? Your, your optimal solution. So, presumably, there's another one where, where the right, the right arm. Is on the <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> But okay. it's, it, these are these are the genes, the genes. They call them AI genes. Mujoko they have all sorts of beautiful names. And gravity is involved in these. Uh, uh, it must be because it's stunning, but I don't know. <laughs> but in your simulation, you have gravity. We use we use their mechanics engine. I see. The only thing is that this is a this is a this is a, these are seventy ODEs and with seventy hundred and fifty parameters. And, and then we optimize the parameters, and that's okay. what we get. So you do better than they do. That's what we find, and we do better in everything. So, so I just I, I don't know. I'm wait. I'm, I keep keep giving this talk until someone suits me down. I, I gave it at Berkeley, where these people supposedly are. I give it in our colleagues here at Harvard. I'll be happy to see if we're doing something fundamentally wrong. Now, just a cute thing that. Uh, uh, Mattia done a, a long time ago that refers to these avoidances and things like that. So here is uh, some simulations by Mattia. So does this play? Yeah, so I'll tell you in a second what this is. So, so here he puts down a whole bunch of particles and give them random motion. 
and then uh, he teaches them to avoid themselves. Okay, tells them avoid hitting each other. So they can look around and they learn to avoid each other, and then you get this type of things. Okay. Uh, now, the other thing that you uh, then after that, what uh, Matthias said, let's put a big obstacle and, and have all these particles uh, moving in a confined uh, region. And then, um, uh, then what, what these particles learn, they learn to avoid the obstacle. And the solution they find is they just circle around the obstacle mm -hmm. and they create a cluster, a ring that create, goes around the obstacle, but they don't hit the obstacle. Is it a cylindrical obstacle? It's a cylindrical obstacle. Okay. Yeah, it's a full 3D thing. Then, uh, whatever what Mattia did, this has not been published, which is a pity. Uh, uh, then Mattia um, said, okay, I learned now a policy through reinforcement learning. Let me now put uh, many obstacles. Um, does this work? Can I create? Um, patterns that um, they, they generate, and they actually generalize. What they have learned was pretty robust. They learn to avoid and they create corridors and all these type of things. And the last uh, and more fun test, Matthias said, now I'm gonna go and, and move the obstacles and uh, can these guys avoid the obstacles? So indeed, we found that they create clusters, but they learn to avoid even moving uh, obstacles. And for me, this is a nice example of a generalizing policy. You learn that, and then it generalizes to this. Here, you see, eventually, they go on to the button again and stay away. But they don't they learn themselves? They're well, no, they create clusters. But, but within, within a cluster, are there excluded binding wraps between the red? Uh, I don't, I think there is some kind of excluded volume that you have. You cannot go close to a certain level, but you still get clusters. And why don't they diffuse away to infinity? Uh, and, I think there, the this is a closed peak. This is a closed peak. But, but even the, the cylinder on the left, the second image from the left. No, yeah, right? here they chose to do that. But they didn't go wandering off to infinity? No, I think because, again, I think, we have, some, we, I think we have either periodic boundary conditions oh, or walls, okay. so it's not an infinite domain. OK. So the, um, it would be an interesting question also, because <laughs> we have to put, uh, I don't know what they will do, actually. Unless, well, you think that entropically, in a big enough box. Entropically, they, yes. They will just, yeah. eventually, they, they will wander off and yeah. do their own thing. Yeah. But maybe they're attracted to each other on the time scale of the simulation. Yeah. Another thing that Mattia did that I thought I'll present today, which is fun, uh, he tried to do, uh, to add um, foraging as a, as a possible reward. And then he was interested to find out whether uh, these guys create clusters when they look for food. Okay, so he has the senses that you can find your nearest neighbor. You know who's near you. You know if there is food. Uh, you have you get reward if there is plus you get food. And then your actions is you go straight, you turn left, and you turn right. And and then uh, starting like that, he you get you get something like this. Uh, you get that the guys, they're able to find food, and as they keep going, they let others, they, they start slowly creating some kind of clusters. Again, I think here they repel from the walls. There's, mm -hmm. no, yeah. There's a single food particle. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then slowly you get to see that because of diffusion or uh, I think these this things, they, you, you get some, it, it starts to get interesting when you add one more action. And the action is the Reynolds model, where you say, I want to align with my neighbors. Basically, I align with my neighbor's velocity. And now when you start to do that, um, you start to find uh, all sorts of clusters uh, that are happening. And, and the last uh, thing is that you, you give it, um, um, you give plus one for food here, now here you tell them you get for you get reward for food, but you should not also collide with each other. And then you get clusters, and and then we got lots of studies. We looked at uh, uh, we looked at uh, at the reward, the average reward. I think the dust line was that if you have uh, food and collisions and the three actions, and if you add the alignment, you get a better reward. Uh, so so we found that if you align and, and create your clusters, you start to, to, to uh, 
um, get more rewards. And, and the logic, the, the, the thinking behind is that as we start to make cluster, we can collect more information that you can pass to, to each other. And so these agents are now reproducing? No, they're not reproducing. It's, I think it's now a that might be interesting too. Can do whatever, yeah, according to food. We can play. I mean, we can, uh, but there is a reinforcement learning behind all that. And yeah. actually, it was pre remember and forget experience we play. It was really primitive reinforcement learning. So, uh, the reward means that every time it visit the food source in a given bunch of time? Yes, uh, it's uh, average over a certain amount of time. So, if we consider the first passage time, does this well enough? I don't remember. This was done about. 17 years ago. No, I'm so, so sorry, I just uh, dug it out because uh, I thought this audience may enjoy saying things like that. Um, I didn't know what to present. We should wrap, probably wrap up fairly soon. So let me, uh, yeah, so what should I show you? So, so we do a lot of other things. So we did uh, all these streamers and, and, and we put the streamers and we taught them uh, they can turn. Um, so they have uh, rotors and they can. This is the vortobots, but with two vortices, and they can turn left and right. And, and then we gave them rewards and states and all these kind of things. And, and then there is all these um, arguments that if you put these dipoles like that or like that, they will be stable or unstable. We could not verify any of that. Uh, what we could find uh, um, that if you put them like this, they always get in the top case, they would collide. In the right other case, they would go left and right. So I don't know what so, we do wrong. So what is the difference in the, in the top and the bottom and the middle there? The, the initial the, uh, conditions. The initial existing this open. Yeah, yeah. Reynolds number is the same? It's, there's no Reynolds number. These are just dipole models. Just dipole models. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, in, instead, what we did is we did reinforcement learning, and we put down a pattern. And we told each one of them, they interact with dipole forces, but we told them each one of them has to follow a particular dot, and then we got them to school. Uh, and as I move on, um, I will move to show you, uh, I will move to the uh, things that we can see here. Uh, yeah, so, so these are some of the things that we uh, did with reinforcement learning, where we, we taught fish to, to follow uh, wakes. Uh, for example, uh, we could uh, teach uh, a fish here to, to do that. Uh, so we taught the fish to, to, stay, uh, has to stay in this box, and then um, it's uh, receiving vorticity from this thing, and it's slaloming, and it stays in this box, and it uses 45% uh, less energy than if it were to move with the velocity of, of, of the corresponding. Does it flow from left to right? There's no flow from left to right, yeah. Semicircular obstacle, yeah. and then mm -hmm. in an angle, yeah. and then the fish somehow yeah. is able to efficiently exploit that yeah. obstacle and grab the obstacle. We also put them, uh, we looked at things that if you can put a fish to swim in, in a way, and so, so here this guy, what it does, it stays on this line. And then we found that staying in this line, even though you get hit by vortices, your efficiency uh, is increasing. And then we said, what if you turn out, tell you, you can maximize your efficiency, so you can be anywhere you want. So it did not fly away, but it stayed actually in the way, but it did something different, which is to shallow and to uh, into the vortices. Uh, something that you can learn from that is that we did then in 3D, we said, we're not going to do reinforcement learning because it's expensive. Let's put one fish behind the other, which is what is the problem with the wind turbines, in my opinion. And now this fish, when you look at the vorticity and count, there's no vortices. So it doesn't really gain anything. But then if you look at the, this is a 2D flow, and this is a cross-section of the 3D flow, fluid mechanics is completely different. So where you want to be is you want to be here to catch energy. And, and we found that indeed we can do that. And I'm going to tell you the details, but we can do things like that, which are heroic uh, simulations because the 3D self-propelled uh, control. Then there's all these other heroic things with that you extract energy from both. You extract energy from one. So. Uh, let me see, I'm gonna close. Um, uh, 
at some point. We went slide 95. <laughs> but we are going beyond what I had in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can, we looked at different things, at uh, drug reduction in schooling, um, all, all sorts of different things. I'm not going to go into the detail. I, I'll stop with uh, uh, this is this is. I'll stop again by by telling you some of the next thing we do. One of the things we do is trying to introduce learning into all these guys to do uh, schooling uh, and to try to have this school active matter and try to use some control or study what happens or examine relationships. Uh, we are looking at. Uh, Sensor placement uh, for the different swimmers. If there is a disturbance here, uh, can you detect it? Um, so where should you be your sensors detected? We are looking into things like that. There is also things like this. Where we are starting. This is work by a postdoc from postdoc of the lab that is doing wind turbines. These are wind turbines, and then he is looking at and then he looks at the energy. A power, the power, this is the instantaneous power for one column. And you can see that it's, it's, it's not the same as the front. The front eats up a lot of things, and the others are. The other thing we do is uh, something that I'm I really excited and I wanted to follow up at some point. We take videos from, from fish, we can take videos from the fish, we can extract the um, the curvature. This is one of those, or some other. This is the real fish. And then we plug it into a navier stokes solver and we can look at the vorticity. So, so that's trying to bridge the, the experiments. And then we're looking at that and then we try to understand if, if they're efficient or, or what they are. And another thing we do is we are, there is a, a device called wind shape, but there's a whole bunch of motors here that are producing wind. There they are. I don't know if you. See, well, there, there's little little blades here, little rubbers, and the idea is that if you want to do testing for drones, the same way as you do for airplanes, for airplanes you put in big wind tunnel yeah. and do that. Uh, it doesn't make sense to do a big wind tunnel for a drone because the, the the flow fields and all these kind of things are more precise. So the idea is, can we, if I have many motors here, can I profile um, flow fields? And we do that through learning, and this is work by my colleague, we did the vertebrates, Slavio Noka, and and I was. There's a simulation on the left, and then the actual. There's there's no experiment. simulation. Uh, these are this is an schematic of of uh, of the project. I think this wind shape now is playing at uh, Caltech somewhere. Uh, they have a big. Um, if I go to. So it's a, yeah, that's what it is here. Maybe you can see it here. And you can tune those motors to make anything. That's right. That's, that's right. Idea. That's the idea. That's the motors here. And I actually can see as well. Uh, and the question is can you, this is a real thing, huh? this is a real uh, um, experiment. Uh, the idea is again from Flavio. I know what's going on here. Anyway, um, that's some of the things where you can have collective uh, movement, and uh, yeah, these are the all the motors. Okay. So we're trying to apply some of these things um, there. I stop. I thank you. I appreciate your patience. Happy to take any questions uh, now, later. Thank you very much, Petros. Yeah. No, there were a lot of questions along the way, and. Anything in the chat or anything? anything that, uh, I see the chat thing. Uh, uh, there's just uh, one question in the chat. Uh, wanting if it's possible, we could go to plan to upload the video results when they sure. I can upload, I'll give you a video of the whole talk. Great. Oh, no, oh, we have to read it, but there's something about the slides as well. We haven't shared the slides. With in general, but a couple of we don't have to do that. No, I'll, 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 I'll upload the video. I'll give you a video of the talk. It's the same as close enough. Thank you. Yeah, well, can as many as you like. 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 Can as many as you like.
and I don't know how to do compressible fluids uh, well with deforming boundaries. This penalization technique may not be the best technique for for um, for these things. Dragonflies. I'm sorry. Uh, the uh, the Well, the, 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 in both cases, there is vorticity that is being generated, and in the birds, I think the wing tip are are the some key things that other birds are actually riding on these wing tips. What we find is that the the the, the fish they produce vortices, wings, and and, and if you have a clean water train, then you can ride this clean water train. Now, what happens when you have the 350 fish and they all have borings that collide, they dissipate, they do whatever you want? Uh, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, it's like, uh, I think you never see, I don't know, I mean, you have all these starlings, right? That they do all the things that they do. I, I don't know how to... In, in that same spirit, what about locusts? Insects. The, 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 the key thing is, I need the technique that I can. If I want to do things, a lot of things, I need a simple grid. Okay, uh, and then to take this canalization technique and put it in a compressible flow, uh, I think this has certain issues. So, and, and what? Where does the compressibility come from? Air. Just, just, just air has. Yeah, yeah. Of... If you can assume that is low speed and low Mach number, and then okay. you can, you can in principle that. Yeah, we have not done the bird. We have not done the, the fish is easier, right? I mean, especially the fish we do, look at that. I mean, we don't have scenes and, <laughs> and all these things. It's simplified. a it's simplified fish, but it's the best we can do. Uh, there are other colleagues who do, who have codes that they do birds, uh, but uh, yeah. I, I've never seen people do two birds, for example, to the best of my knowledge. It's complicated to do two birds. Uh, I and mean, here I'm doing 350 fish because I can I have all this computation expertise, etc. But to do a swarm, a, a cloud of red, a, a, a V formation birds, I, would be something. So we have a question from the chat. Has anyone thought of studying the movement of sperm inside the uterus? Fish swimming look very simple. The moment of sperm inside the uterus, uh, that would be an interesting. Uh, that would be an interesting project. I think we're, I have an interest in this artificial uh, insemination uh, with all these microbots that we are making. Um, for the sperm, we would need to, to model it appropriately. And I showed you some of the issues we have, even with the red blood cells that are, uh, we don't know how to do flagella uh, well. Uh, it's something I have in my mind for a long time, how to do flagella. Um, so I'll be, of course, um, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you when you introduce the penalized model of uh, the method, you have a slide that looks like if you start moving the, the grid is also moving a bit. No, what is no the grid is not moving. So the resolution of the grid is changing. So what are we seeing as this light box? The resolution of the grid is changing. So the fish is moving. So you have a grid. Imagine you have a, 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 a grid everywhere in this room, okay? Now the fish is coming. Now things are happening at the tail of the fish. Now, the, wherever the fish is, more resolution is applied automatically in this areas. We so, wait it. So in the context of this nice picture here, there'd be a finer permissions fixed orientation. Yeah, so there'd be a yeah, finer but, uh, near the tail. Everywhere here, the fish there would be, uh, yeah, there would be this guy moves, leaves behind the vortex, and, and then this guy now is over here, and then this, this thing is not needed anymore, but it's needed over here. Would the fish's motion be slightly biased by the orientation of the mesh? Oh, of course, but uh, it's, it's probably <laughs> there, well, there, there's there's there. 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 Yeah. So we, we've tried a lot of things on that, yeah. Which one? I mean, I showed many. Yes. <laughs> so, I think this is the velocity field. This? Yes. Like, what are these like? I think this is velocity. Uh, 
think this is the chi function and this is the velocity vectors. It's, it's, a, it's a deformation velocity. The deformation velocity of, of the fish. The penalization we have this velocity field corresponding to the motion of the object. Okay. And this is basically visualization of this uh, that field. And how did you describe the kinematic boundary condition along the fish? Is that like an equation of the fish? The, the kinematic and, and the viscous boundary condition are combined here. Okay. And there's so, an explicit equation for the fish. Here, that's the equation. Yeah. We have the no through and the no slip are in here. Okay. Okay, so, but let, 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 so the penalization has problems. Right? It's not that the penalization has no problems. So let me tell you the problem of, of penalization. So if you want to do things the proper way, in my opinion, you do everything in vorticity and, and you have a vortex sheet on the surface of the body that enforces the kinematics, which is the no through flow. You break the flow into uh, kinematics and dynamics, okay? So the kinematics is no penetration, Okay, and the dynamics is no tangent, no, no tangent velocity. No penetration means that um, you can do that. There is something called the light field algorithm. That's what I did in my PhD thesis, by the way, uh, where you specify because you have no penetration, you can assume that you have a slip velocity on the body. Okay, you are allowed to have a slip velocity. The slip velocity now is a, a vortex sheet, a vortex layer. Okay, you accept that. I can solve with singularities, which are vortices, the potential flow around the body. Okay. Now, now, if you think about it, as soon as I have a vortex sheet here, this is affecting the velocity field everywhere. It's an elliptic problem. I solve the Poisson equation, elliptic problem, velocity is affected everywhere. This does not affect everything everywhere. It's local. Yeah, and, and it waits for a few time step by iterations until it propagates what has happened on the surface. According to the life algorithm and what I did in my thesis, now the next step is this vortex sheet, you diffuse it. And you basically solve the vorticity equation with a Neumann boundary condition, a vorticity flux that puts vorticity in the flow field and, and, and everything is okay because the vorticity has basically got removed from the boundary to the nearest point, but all the far field intera interactions are occupied. So we've done a lot of, um, uh, uh, work to compare this method I just told you it is exact in my opinion because you can show the exact solution of the number of early on for an impulsive distorted body with um, a penalization and in penalization we have to use smaller steps than you can use with that and you use time smaller time steps because as you generate vorticity slowly on the boundary you hope that this thing is gonna inform the far field in the same way as doing it in one step so just to follow up on the question, the interesting question about the white dots in this lovely movie here, that that's not, those are not at mesh points. There's a very fine mesh we're not seeing, and you're just taking a set of, if I understand correctly. This is what, this is the chi function here, right? So the line is the chi function, <laughs> and the thing is that the shape of the body is computed in, in its own frame of reference, so it's okay. basically centered at the body, and then you start deforming it and moving it at the, co at the corresponding position on the mesh. You have to interpolate. interpolate the, 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 but, the but that is, mesh. So that is a dynamical mesh. It's not rigid. So no, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a, if I may. Um, it was a track somewhere, but I, I can get you one. I think that the body is uh -huh. the real body. And then there is a good the, the, the shape of the body. That's the, that's, the, that's the mesh around the body. All right, thank you. So there's the, the mesh of the fluids. I see. The mesh of the fluids fixed, but there's the yeah. mesh of the body. But the, but the body, um, whatever you have here, you can interpolate on the I see. The, the fluid mesh does not change. That's the thing. It's kind of like an immersion. It's very related to the immersed boundary. Okay. Uh, and, and I think, in my opinion, the two methods are, are very similar, uh, and, and whatever problem this method has, I think mesh boundary has, and vice versa. <laughs> so that's it. It's just that this one has a one great benefit. One great benefit uh, by collect by computing the velocity field inside the body, you get the propulsive velocity of this guy. In the mesh boundary, you have to compute forces. You have to do all this mess around the body, all this 
stuff. And that's why I initially I was doing immersed boundary. And then I, I switched to that because this gives me propulsion for free. That's, that's one edge for the penalization. You're welcome. So it's now 2.30. So thank everybody for the questions, but especially thank Petros for a lovely talk. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody, in still land. <laughs> the 12, the 12 <laughs> disciplines still Goodbye, in Zoomers. Zoomers. Yeah, bye. Bye, there. Thank you. See you. Two weeks. Great. Great.